I repent in behalf of this man that is on the edge of death and his brain being cooked. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show most uh, Tuesdays, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Uh, this is a viewer and listener supported project. Uh, give me fucking money. You can uh, support this project at echoplexmedia.com. Click support. Uh, November 1st, uh, this tinfoil hat that I'm wearing, tinfoil hat version 2.0, uh, comes out at eplex.store, which is a great place to also support us with a monthly membership. Uh, the black with uh, pink writing will be available, but also there will be pink with black writing. And just a reminder, this will come out on the 31st and that'll be the last day to get any of our Halloween, uh, 2024 stuff. Uh, I'm producer Dave. You can find me on grinder. Uh, and this is the councilman. As always, you can find me at T H E underscore councilman on X. And you can also find me knocking doors. Cause really that's all that's left to do between now and election day. Knock on your dough. 
Are you going to vote? Why ain't you voted? Get your vote in. And I'm definitely going to be getting one of them pink tinfoil hats. Um, we're rocking the pink on one of the campaigns I'm rolling with right now, and it would just fit the, the mood so perfectly. So I'm Fantastic. Down. So a lot has happened uh, since the last time we down balloted. Shit, yeah. So, uh, well, not just in local news, but also we're in uh, 1080p now. Holy shit, really? Yeah. I wonder why I look so damn good. I mean, look at me. <laughs> you see all the blemishes, and all the little gray hair. Yeah, we're, we're in 1080p. It took me it took me a while because I had to I installed a new version of the operating system, which was fraught with problems okay. because they changed some important things. But uh, oh, fabulous. I figured since I'd already spent so damn much time on that, I might as well redo the overlay in uh, 1080p so that um fucking, I don't know, so the people on the podcast can hear it. <laughs> I, I love it, man. I think the people on the podcast need really good video. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you're checking the podcast out, do make sure to check out the Twitch channel. It's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. And we are on YouTube uh, for the time being. It's at Echoplex Media. We'll see. We'll see. We'll try not to cover, try not to cover too many more uh like Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors call in shows. I'm subscribed, so I, I will know as soon as you get banned, it'll just come off my subscribe you know, channels list. <laughs> so yeah, you'll have you should check out the you should check out the show. You are in a circle right now, by the way. A circle? Yeah, there's like a, instead of your your camera being a, a rectangle, it's a circle right now. Oh, interesting. Oh, I dig this. I should definitely check out the channel. Yeah, yeah. Um I think, I think I'll just roll with the square here because it might freak me out to see a circle. Well, circle that's meets. not your choice. Well, anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's all right. We'll play so, Hollywood Squares later. What do we have for leading off? Well, uh, I don't know if anyone heard, but there's an election happening, I guess, like now. Um, and, uh, you know, local volunteers are encouraging folks to get out the early vote. And you can do that uh, starting this week, actually. You can get out just about anywhere and uh, find a vote center and get your vote on, whether you want to drop off your mail-in ballot or you want to vote in person, and we're going to hear more about it from local news. Early voting, it's already underway in some Bay Area cities, with dozens more centers opening today. As KTV's Amanda Quintana shows us, volunteers from both parties were out today working to get out the vote. More than 100 South Bay Democrats were up before the sun Saturday to head to Reno. The goal, get people to vote for Kamala Harris. The research shows 100% and our experience as political organizers, it shows that knocking on someone's door and talking to them is overwhelmingly the most effective way to influence their vote and to get them to vote. In California, we have a, the Democratic Party has a big lead. In Nevada, it's close. Aaron Schumann says he hasn't done a trip for a candidate like this since the 70s, but he says now is the time to step up. I feel that this election is an is a critical election uh, that that really the future of the country is at stake. I'm a hardworking middle class American. I'm very patriotic. And I see that our democracy is really on the line here. Uh, we have a choice with a candidate who has fresh new ideas and she brings a huge amount of energy and positivity, which I believe we really need. Volunteer Kathleen Conley says this is an opportunity she just couldn't pass up. Buses also left Berkeley and San Francisco. Local Republican volunteers are focusing their efforts here. They're knocking on doors. They're making phone calls for our local candidates. Uh, we have a lot if somebody asked me to draw the vice chairman of the Bay Area of California or the California the Bay Area regional chairman, I probably would have drawn this guy. Pretty close. Uh, Maybe so shaved. Races that are probably winnable. Jason Clark, so, California Republican. He's rocking the, uh, the J.D. Vance like tribute beard. 40,000 new Republicans have registered in the Bay Area in the last few months. He's hopeful they will turn out to vote for Donald Trump and many of the Republicans in local races. I think it's just sort of a, a full on sprint until the November 5th, and then that's when uh, when the voters decide. The Ventura Center here in Palo Alto. The guy looked like a cross between Kevin Spacey and a school shooter. Vote early. Experts are predicting four in 10 Americans will vote before Election Day. I wanted to be sure I do the earliest I can because it's really important. Early voting has become more popular after 2020 and was largely dominated by Democrats. So far, data shows Republicans have cast more early ballots in Arizona and Nevada, while more Democrats have voted early in Pennsylvania. Out of the three and a half million people so far who voted in California early, over one million of those are Republicans. Um, and I think about one. That's not a good ratio, friend. Democrats. 
in Palo Alto. Amanda Quintana, KTVU, Fox 2 News. So a little less than one in three. It's pretty good for, you know, the Republican Party in California, which is only about a quarter of the electorate in most places um, and overall. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're doing well and they're definitely returning ballots at a much higher clip than other demographics here in Santa Clara County and in Alameda County and most of the Bay Area counties. Um, but that's pretty standard. Um, actually, it's going back to <clears throat> sort of traditional norms. Um, there was, a, I think, a very big push uh, within the Republican Party and conservative ranks to not trust vote by mail, not to trust the early vote, not to trust um, these sort of non-traditional voting uh, methods. Um, and so you saw more Republicans voting on election day or just dropping off their ballot on election day. Um, but I think that's coming back around again. And we're seeing right now, at least from the numbers I'm seeing, very old, very Republican slash Democratic slash partisan electorate um, and a very white electorate that's coming out across the board. Well, yeah, I don't know. Vote early and uh, don't vote often because that's a felony. Definitely, especially if you're like registered in multiple places and you get multiple ballots. I mean, the temptation's there, right? but they'll find you out. They will find out if you vote. Yeah, vote early, vote once. Once. Vote once. So we're going to move on to down ballot and uh, recall watch. Uh, we're going to follow, it's a bit of a follow up. You could imagine um, a, a recall petition in San Jose that actually probably. Based on what I've seen so far, um, that's just what the recall is for, actually. Yes, actually, I think this is exactly the situation that recall was built for. We're going to find out more about it. It's not going to be on the ballot next week, but this is uh, it's hard to ignore this news um, as much as we want to focus on November the 5th. So we're going to uh, keep following up on this, and so it's bitter end. Uh, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately, as we've heard, uh, there's a council member who is facing allegations of sex misconduct with a minor um, and uh, he has been absent from city council meetings he has requested a leave of absence for mental health purposes um, he's pretty much done everything except what he more than likely should do and what many people are calling upon him to do including the mayor all of his colleagues and uh, many uh, local uh, organizations and individuals and that's to resign he's not apparently interested in doing that um, and looks like he's interested more in sitting this out until it blows over <laughs> um, and seeing what happens. But uh, we're going to find out more about what the community now is uh, exploring as far as their options um, if he's not going to step aside. And now at five, a growing recall movement in the South Bay. Embattled council member Omar Torres is facing calls from many of his constituents to leave his seat. Hopefully he resigns before then, but we need the recall, get him out of office. Let's get some representation back in there. Torres has been absent from the city council for weeks now amid a police investigation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alex Savage. And I'm Greg Lee. Some San Jose residents and downtown business owners say it's clear Torres no longer has his constituents' best interests in mind. And now they're launching an effort to remove him from office. New at 5, KTVU's Ann Rubin joining us live tonight from City Hall, where organizers held a news conference earlier today. And. His constituents say they need representation, and right now they believe Omar Torres is more concerned with his own problems than with theirs. As well he should be. Enough is enough. That's the message from community leaders in San Jose. This is pretty much a District 3 community SOS. They say embattled city council member Omar Torres is no longer fit to serve, and they're launching an effort to recall him. It was the voters who put him in office. It will be the voters who remove him from office. Torres is currently... God, he's going to go down like 10 to 1 in the recall if that happens. ...a series of sexually explicit messages about children. His attorney called them fantasy and role play. Community leaders call them a disgrace. What's been said has been largely inappropriate. The council members lost trust in the community. Folks are looking for representation. We don't have anyone at council who's representing us. For three, Can we pause him, this for a second? He's been absent yeah. from the council. I uh, just wanted to point out... Um, um, if you, uh, we don't have to go back to him, but uh, mullet man there or Martin Van Buren, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call him. Uh, his name is Matt Cavedo. He's actually a staffer for Mayor Mahan. He's been on Mayor Mahan's staff since Mayor Mahan was Councilmember Mahan. 
and he is consistently used as while this is completely legitimate the, the call for the recall he's consistently used as like a, a, a astroturf uh, to be brought in to prop up and speak out on issues that the mayor is very concerned about um, but always as community member or community leader and never as you know in his actual capacity or um, with that label and it's really shoddy, shoddy journalism uh, to not point that out. Um, yeah, I was going to say, of, I'm not going to, Ed, Ed two, Mayor Ed 209 or his staffer aren't the problem here, right? It's the fucking media. Correct. Right, yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, they're just they're just taking advantage of uh, the media's uh, com- complicity in this. But, yeah, it would be better if, like, D, for example, D Baudigan, who was in there, she would be much better, and they misspelled her name, of course, in the Chiron. She would be much better speaker um, and, uh, and someone to, to represent the cause and be the front and center person than that dude i'm very glad he wasn't wearing his traditional scarf he wears scarves even in 90 degree weather so good on him sure, that's but an that, ascot that ascot well i know it's definitely a scarf he's definitely wearing a <laughs> scarf um and we've seen him before in other videos but that the beard has taken on a life of its own now it's it's gone well beyond um uh what is acceptable norms uh in a, in a public environment He's been stripped of all his committee positions, and he's requested a 30-day medical leave to address his mental health, which has not yet been approved. He's been absolutely silent. He's not attended any public meetings, city council meetings. So he basically is a yeah, bad Jeff, Jeff would be a good, another good speaker. And his responsibilities. Maybe Red Jeff should run. need to take yeah. action, especially well, someone's going to have to. Council has no mechanism to vote him out. City council member Bian Duan wants to change that. Even after this, we make sure you change the policies, change the charters, so that way, if this ever happened again, we have ability to remove a council member the recall is a slow process residents are no you don't want the other council members just to be able to kick off the council member they don't like right you don't want that correct like it's a slippery slope um yeah that would be great to have that power in a situation like this but what about another exactly what about another situation where it's used for political gain or retribution i could see language where if, if someone is charged with a felony then the remaining members can unanimously remove somebody, but like, it would have to be like very conditioned. Like, yeah, it's, and it's, it just gets very dicey when it comes to people who are elected by the people. Um, so, uh, when, when you have an, when you have an official vote, it, it's very hard to undo that vote without the people being involved in some way. Um, now granted they could make the case that these council members are representatives of the city and of the people. Um, but they're not, like his representatives, right? They're not, or I'm sorry, they're not his constituents' representatives. They represent other districts, um, even though they represent the city as a whole. So it's it gets a little bit gray uh, area. The, at the end of the day, you should just resign. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Regulating a petition, a need to collect more than 5,000 signatures. It could take months. They're really hoping Omar... That shit will take three weeks, dude. Instead. I'm hoping over the next couple of weeks and with the pressure of a recall um, that he'll do the right thing for, for the city and for his constituents. We reached out to Omar Torres, but have not heard back. Organizers of the recall effort hope to file an... Uh, um, a notice of intent in the next week or two, and then they believe they might have enough signatures to proceed by the end of the year. Greg? A story we'll continue to follow. And Ruben live in San Jose. Ooh, us too. And thank you. The Alabama- yeah, we'll be following for sure um, as this progresses. I, I, I don't think it'll get to the point of getting on the ballot, but then again, fuck. Uh, so um, it's worth noting that Omar was a. Uh, disciple of Magdalena Carrasco who preceded him on the council in district five. And, uh, she was of course at one point married to him, the, uh, baby mama to, uh, Kevin De Leon, who was at one point a state Senator. Um, and, uh, is, I believe now still, still, or maybe just recently voted off or about to be voted off the city council in Los Angeles. And he, you will recall, um, producer Dave, I believe we covered this, even though it's out of our area, um, but there was a big kerfuffle um, last year or so with uh, uh, some quite racist comments that were made, presumably in private, that were made public um, with a number of council members in Los Angeles um, implicated. And Kevin De Leon was the sort of lone uh, outlier who did not resign and just refused to resign, tried to wait it out and 
figured out people's short memories would come into play and I, he'd be able to skate eventually and he's still trying to do that and i think he might still be up for re-election i'm not sure but anyway that the point is that that's the the line the, the genealogy in politics that omar follows and so it it's entirely plausible and in fact quite conceivable that he would just try to wait this out and it could get on the ballot um but uh we shall see we shall see i don't know what the council has in terms of uh, options if he should resign. I think they have the option of appointing someone and or calling an election at this point. So um, that'll be very interesting if he should resign. Uh, and we'll see who, who lines up. I'm uh, guessing he's going to. I just wonder what the timeline is here. Do you, I'm thinking like the smart play, taking the 30 days or whatever to do the mental health thing. When you get out of that fucking thing, resign. Just resign. Be like, I've spoken to my therapist and all this stuff, and we decided that it's not that I'm not, you know, capable of representing you. And you know, I'm sorry that I left this seat vacant for 30 days. And uh, I'll go ahead and stay out of the process for uh, finding my replacement. Bye. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, there's not a lot of business before the council that's incredibly pressing over the next month or so. Um, but at the same time, this district. You know, it, it's just lacking representation. Like he's not showing up for meetings. He's been stripped of all his committee assignments. Uh, and his staff, I'll, I'll be entirely honest, his staff was not, you know, necessarily the crack staff to begin with, but what we're dealing with city hall. So what do you expect? Um, so it, it, it's his constituents are not being well served right now. Uh, but I know Omar and he is stubborn to a fault. And uh, so we, the fault might come into play here. Hopefully not. I really hope he does listen. All right. Well, we got more news from uh, San Jose. This is about a, uh, yeah. a candidate um, who is a subject of a criminal investigation. Right. Can't even get on the city council yet and already <laughs> already being asked to resign. Um, but yeah, the community is not very happy about this. I think the charge was dropped, but pretty much on a technicality. Uh, but anyway, we're going to learn more about uh, a candidate who stepped in it um, in his attempt to get on the council. And by the way, he's Questions of trust surround City Hall. The community wants dependable city leaders who hold themselves to high ethical standards, not those surrounded with legal troubles. And residents who represent various unions, coalitions, and associations are speaking out against San Jose City Council candidate Tam Trong. We collectively call upon Tam Trong, a candidate for San Jose City Council in District 8, to publicly end his candidacy. Trong is a sergeant with the San Jose Police Department, but has been on administrative leave and has had his officer certification temporarily suspended. Trong is charged with grand theft for allegedly using his position as a cop to defraud mortgage companies of more than half a million dollars. Oh, shit. I mean, I don't know. Fucking talk about nobody to fucking root for. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, something, he definitely did something, but again, he got, he, he, just because you can't get legally prosecuted doesn't mean you didn't do anything bad. Theft. How can we let someone with this disgraceful history seek a position of power? His pending criminal case will make it impossible oh, for him to effectively represent his 100,000 constituents in District 8. Trong's campaign office sent us a statement. Of course, he drives a Tesla. It's a political ploy. Quote, it is clear to the people in our district that these political operatives are targeting me because of my strong stand on safety and because I'm demanding greater accountability on homeless spending. How did you give the 500,000 to the homeless? Despite the allegations and loss of key endorsements like that of Mayor Matt Mahan, Trong is remaining in the race. The Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters Office says more than 100,000 and ballots are already being processed and Trong remains a candidate. At this point, it's too late to have him removed from the ballot. The election still happens. We still certify there's a winner, right? The winner, if they want to resign, they can. If somebody wants to recall them, that's a different process, but the ballots still count and we still certify the election as is with the ballots that already went out. So at this point, the future of San Jose's District 8 rests in the hands of voters. In San Jose, Dustin Dorsey, ABC7 News. Do you know if he was, like, favored to win or anything like that? Uh, hard to say. Uh, he's running against uh, an incumbent, an appointed incumbent, Domingo Candelas, who was appointed last year to replace a council member who was uh, elected to the Board of Supervisors. So it's anyone's guess, but uh, from everything I've heard, Domingo has done everything he needs to do to secure a victory and a, and a sort of, re, quote-unquote, re-election. 
Um, he's literally everywhere uh, and everything all at once to everyone. And that's kind of what you have to be um, in a short time frame when you you were appointed, you know, a year and a half ago, and now you got to run for election. Um, so you have an, you don't really have that benefit of incumbency in terms of like the longevity of uh, in people's mind and uh, and them having voted for you even before, right? Um, but he's done everything he could to shore that up. So long story short, I think he's in good shape already, and this just does not help him uh, at all. However. You know, as the Vietnamese candidate in the race, District 8 has a very substantial Vietnamese population. So if they were to say, well, I don't care about whatever with, with Tom, I'm going to vote for the Vietnamese candidate, he, he'll do pretty well. He'll pull a pretty large, substantial chunk of the vote. But there's enough white, Latino, and other votes uh, in that area to, uh, to make Domingo your prohibitive favorite. And I mean, some of that vote that may have been like kind of baked in for, from the beginning, some of those people may not may be like, well, I don't want to vote for a fucking fraud. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to help anything at all, even though it was the charge was dropped um, as of a couple of days ago, so it's uh, good on him. He's not going to jail. Um, but uh, I think Domingo was in the catbird seat to begin with uh, in this race, and it's an important race. It's uh, It will determine, you know, what the council make up, what the values of the council look like moving forward. Um, and it's important to note that Mayor Mahan had thrown his weight behind this candidate um, uh, because he felt he would be more acquiescent to the mayor's uh, profile and, and his agenda. Um, so mayor's not going to get, he, he's unendorsed now. <laughs> so even if Tom were to pull it out, um, he's probably not going to get much out of that relationship at this point. So yeah, this is a, this is a loss for mayor at 209 and a win for whatever you want to call it, the progressive majority on the council. Very nice. Well, we're going to move to Alameda County and we got a <clears throat> two recalls, I suppose on the ballot. Um, well, for, for Oakland residents anyway. Correct. And there's a lot of crossover there, but uh, yeah. So the mayor of Oakland and the DA of uh, Alameda County, as we have covered extensively on down ballot are both facing a recall on next Tuesday. We're going to find out how things are going in that race from KPI. All right, voters in Alameda County are deciding whether to recall two women from high profile public offices. Oakland Mayor Good point. and Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price. They've both faced political pressure about how their respective offices have handled crime and the perception that some parts of the East Bay have become more dangerous. Well, tonight, Arcady Nielsen is taking a look at how the use of the, the perception. Process. Notice how they never fucking tell you the fucking like they go, oh, well, people think it's more dangerous. Well, you're the news, motherfucker. What about yeah, what? Where are the facts? Where is the data? Right? What are the rates? Like, yeah, <clears throat> people tell us it's very, very dangerous out there. Right, right. <laughs> because there's numbers that show that almost every major city is down to pre-pandemic violent crime levels, and some of the some of the major cities, I know San Francisco included, are like the property crime is now below the pan the pre-pandemic level, and so like. Why couldn't the news, like, it only takes a second to be like, well, uh, these perceptions are incorrect and here's some numbers and then do the rest of the fucking story. Oh, but that's not fun. There's no fun in that story. Actually, you know, saying that, and you don't want to tell any of their, their lead generators that they're wrong because then they'll stop getting the leads. Yeah, but the their lead people. generator is just like somebody complaining that they don't, that they think it's dangerous. That's not really, you're not getting a lead from that person. <laughs> But I, well, that's that's all they need, right? That's all they that's all they need to make a story because that person is the one who calls, right? But there's there's thousands of that person, and they're the ones that watch the local news, and the local news knows this, right? So they get the call from, you know, whoever, uh, uh, Jane Ann, uh, concerned about something, and they run with the story because they know that there's tons of Jane Anns out there that are watching their show, and they want they want to feed the beast, right? Um, they don't really care that it's not that big of a story. It's just what they do, right? They make a big story out of nothing. Um, that's the local news. That's that's why we have down ballot. So we can cut through that's that shit. changed over time in California. And the questions about whether these recalls have more to do with gross misconduct or simply voters' remorse. What's happening in terms dun, dun, dun. of... 
Prop 8, or really kind of moving forward with Prop 3. This is David McEwen's senior level political science class at Sonoma State University, where the student's midterm assignment was to break down ballot questions in the upcoming election. 40% of the funds have been earmarked for low-income communities. McEwen is a professor and an expert when it comes to state and local elections. He's done extensive research specifically around recalls and how they've been used in California. Voters use that as a way to uh, give voice to their angst. The 2003 recall of then-Governor Gray Davis in favor of Arnold Schwarzenegger is the per- God, Arnold was, a fucking, Arnold was fucking shocking as shit, but that, we don't have time for that. I just remember when California passed Prop 8 and he was hell mad. He's like, what are you doing? Voter Don't do it. Davis became the scapegoat for the public's anger over the energy crisis and Enron Black. Yeah, he got rolled by Enron, dude. He got he basically got recalled by Enron. Got a bad yeah. deal, and I said to him, I did get a bad deal, and I believe that things do even up over time. So, in my case, I got a good break, or else I wouldn't have been younger, and I wouldn't have had five years of signings. But I think it's good legislation. So. Good break at the beginning, not so good break at the end, but I'd rather have had the opportunity to be governor than not at all. Even though Davis was a direct casualty of the recall process, two decades later, he still believes in the principle that voters have the right to change their mind. Someone said I wanted a progressive district attorney and now I don't. Hey, that's life. If you're thinking of running for office and you don't like the fact that the, that the public has these three powers, initiative, referendum and recall, then I respectfully suggest you look at some other state to run for office. With the gift of hindsight, he has one piece of advice for those in Northern California facing a recall. Instead of railing against the cross and say, say how unfair it is, make the case as to why Oakland or Alameda County are better off keeping you in office. Those questions are now in the hands of voters. Are the respective offices better served by Tao and Price, or should they be replaced? The recall effort against Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price began before she even hit the 100-day mark in office. She ran on criminal justice reform and not using enhancements to beef up jail sentences that she said disproportionately impacted people of color. Now, since she was elected, she made good on her promises, and critics immediately started saying she was soft on crime and was contributing to a rising crime rate by not coming down hard enough on repeat offenders. Tao resign now! Tao resign now! The recall effort against Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao started in January, with critics saying she contributed to the public safety crisis partly through budget mismanagement. The drumbeat only got louder after an FBI raid at the mayor's home in June of this year. She has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. More recently, she's been under fire for the city's ongoing budget crisis and the Oakland Coliseum deal. Nice job, you guys. Nice job. McEwen worries there could be a snowball effect with recalls as we're seeing more and more hit the ballots. Recalls like this, if they become successful, can be an important learning moment for all sides about what works and what doesn't work and the threshold it takes to pay to play. It has been more than 100 years since the Oakland mayor has faced a recall on the ballot and the Alameda County District Attorney has never had a recall on the ballot before. Now, both of these recalls only need a simple majority to pass well that's i mean if you're going to do the recall if it only if you just got a win to win then i guess a simple majority would be the rational thing for, for the recall to pass i mean it's the rational thing for any vote really we're going to learn more about that later during ballot box bingo um but it's yeah a majority you would think it's democracy so anytime there's a vote the majority plus one you know should be uh the winner uh but yeah not not always well, any, we any shall polling see. on any of these? Yeah, I would think. I don't. I hadn't seen any, at least in the news. Um, I'm sure there's tons of polling, and I'm sure some folks who are very interested are paying for for polling. Um, I I hesitate to guess uh, at this point. We'll see. I, it seems to be people are pretty recall happy these days. But I do agree with Gray Davis in one uh, aspect in uh, the messaging around. Uh, around this if you're the can if you're the elected official who's facing the recall you should really treat it as though it's a re-election campaign treat it like you have an opponent your opponent are these people who are putting up the the recall against you um but justify why you should stay right don't focus on the you know how silly it is that the recall is happening people will get that don't focus on how it's unfair 
whatever, it's just going to be sour grapes, right? And all they're doing is railing against you for what this, that, and the other thing. So talk about all the good things you're doing. Talk about all the great things you're doing and you're going to keep doing and make it more aspirational. That I think wins the day over the, you know, the bitterness of, uh, you know, oh, I don't. <clears throat> and if you're going to badmouth anybody, badmouth the people bankrolling the recall. Don't badmouth the recall process itself. Right, right. Uh, but you're, and you're just dealing in this case, especially with um, DA Price. You're dealing with victims' families and people who are just very, very sensitive already. And um, you know they've, you know, in some ways, you know, you can say what you want, right? You can say the recall pr- uh, promoters are you know, manipulating them and using them as, you know, uh, uh, props, uh, in their effort because they just don't like the a price and they don't like restorative justice and they don't like reduced minimum, you know, mandatory minimums and reduced sentences. Um, so, uh, you could say that, um, but, uh, at, at end of the day, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to make them the enemy. Right. So if anything, yeah, stay positive about yourself and talk about all the good things or- you're doing. <clears throat> If you're fairly confident, you can just shut the fuck up about it. You could do that too. It's not happening. Keep doing your job, and when you're asked about it, you go, "I'm confident I'm going to defeat this recall, and I'm busy doing my job." Yeah. You know, well, to that to that end, it's like it, this is the job that they elected me to do, right? I just ran on this platform. I'm doing the thing. So here's exactly what you voted for me to do, and trust that the people will say, "Yeah, that's what I wanted," and keep you in office. Um, it's hard to look at what happened to Chesa in San Francisco and think that that's the, the right way to flow. Um, but at the same time, you know, again, every election is unique and uh, you just got to stand behind your values and what you're, what you're doing and not get so caught up in the, the bullshit back and forth. So I was asking about polling for that. We don't have polling for that, but it looks like there is some polling for the San Francisco mayoral race. Yeah. Always hard. I mean, both of these, all these races are ranked choice voting. So it's, um, uh, but with re- with recall, it's a little more yes yeah, or no. Yes or no. With with this race, um, I should just say all these jurisdictions are ranked choice voting. With this race, ranked choice voting definitely comes into play, and it's a little bit harder to poll. I don't know if they've figured it out yet, but we'll find out more from KPIX. 15 days away from Election Day. Today is the last day to register to vote online. You have until midnight tonight. However, there is still time to register in person. So one of our most closely watched races right here in the Bay Area is the San Francisco's mayoral race. London Breed is trying to defend her seat against four top challengers. But as Wilson Walker shows us, the latest polls indicate it is still anybody's race. You think back to when this race was taking shape, the conventional wisdom was that it was going to be a close race, ranked choice voting. Maybe that would allow a progressive outsider to slip past a raft of moderates. And since then, the conversation changed a number of times. Now here we are just a couple weeks out from Election Day, and suddenly it looks like that first impression wasn't so far off. God bless America. Yeah, we're about two weeks. Well, we're two weeks in. We're two weeks away. Uh, an early voting period as we get into towards the election. For John Arntz and the San Francisco Department of Elections, this is the halfway point, and this milestone comes with two new polls in the city's closely watched mayoral race. The first, released by the Aaron Peskin campaign, shows the supervisor... Oh, get the fuck out of here. ...to a tie for first place votes with Daniel Lurie. Look, the other three candidates, all of them supported by billionaires who are pushing San Francisco in the wrong direction, have been busy tearing each other down. Um, For Peskin, it would be something of a comeback, having been largely left out of the conversation for the last couple months. And there is some history to support the idea of a late progressive surge. Yeah, so that's, again, historically what we've seen in San Francisco elections is that a progressive candidate emerges towards the end of the election um, and often surpasses the the latest poll numbers. And we can go back to any number of elections, really for back for more than 20 years, to see that the progressive vote tends to coalesce late. The second poll conducted by the San Francisco Chronicle shows Peskin having jumped ahead of Mark Farrell for first place votes, but behind a dead heat between Mayor London Breed and Daniel Lurie, who has for several weeks now appeared to have an edge in polling that factors in ranked choice voting. From out of control spending on nonprofits that have failed to deliver results, uh, I think Daniel Lurie has run a, a near flawless campaign in positioning himself as an outsider, but it's still everything is within the margin of error. 
And that brings us back to the elections office and something else that will play a huge role in this race, something we first started talking about back in April, and that is the consolidation of city elections. That means the mayor's race is going to get presidential turnout, which is a lot more votes. And voters have now had two weeks to cast votes in this election. Uh, but the total is less than what we would expect normally at this time for a presidential contest being on the ballot. Yes, the return maybe more people are just mailing it. Which is a very good sign that people are still watching this race and holding off on making that three vote calculation maybe until the last minute. I think the I mean there are still organizations that whose endorsements have just come out. I think voters are still sifting through a lot of information. And to your point, I think we're sort of roughly back where the race appeared to have started. And that, in turn, tells us something else, right? If voters are waiting until the final hours, perhaps, to make this decision, it means that the numbers we see on election night will be an increasingly smaller fraction of the total vote. And that means that it will take even longer to count all of the votes that come in later and then have to sort through the ranked choice voting round. So yes, the evidence already piling up that the race will be close. And it may be several days before we know who the next mayor of San Francisco is going to be. So the first one was from Peskin's campaign. So yes. but I'm surprised to see him that close in the in the Chronicle poll, if I'm being honest. Well, I mean, I, th- I think as we've talked about it, uh, previously here, it's you know, it's it is London breed versus the four white dudes. And well, right. Asha, I guess um, Asha projects is right. Uh, but uh truthfully it's it's Aaron Peskin the progressive against moderate all these all these moderate bootlickers yeah um whether they're uh, black women or white men um so he has the advantage of being able to claim that lane pretty much so you're going to see i think we're going to be tested the San Francisco is going to be tested to see how progressive they are i don't think they are very progressive right now i think i do think that's going to be Lurie or Breed that comes out here um i'm I'm actually surprised to see Daniel Lurie doing so well. Um, or maybe right, I, I thought the be. former cop was going to be the one that maybe it was the 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 person who ended up taking it to uh, London Breed that where it would be close. Perhaps I or the, or the that former she... mayor. Uh, maybe he is a former <laughs> mayor and a former cop. Is that right, Mark Farrell? Yeah, I, I forget what his profession was before he was a supervisor and mayor, interim mayor. But um, honestly, I, I thought that Breed would do much better in coast because she was running against these the four white dudes of the apocalypse um so or at least the four white dudes calling for the apocalypse or saying that we're in the apocalypse um so i'm a little surprised she's not doing better but um uh, i guess it makes me f- it, it makes me feel good and bad at the same time because it's like I, i'd feel good that people recognize that she is full of shit <laughs> and and she has been uh she is not i don't think worthy of being reelected. and at the same time like I would vote for Aaron Peskin, I guess, if I had no, ch- if I had a choice yeah. between these candidates. Um, but to see Daniel Lurie, the, I mean, I get it, it's almost like the this campaign. Daniel Lurie's campaign is exactly what I thought would win the day in San Jose recently in mayor's races, and it kind of was with with Ed Two Hundred Nine. He was even though he was on the council already, he was still able to run that sort of outsider like city hall is fucked, and I'm I'm from the I am tech bro, and I can save it right. That's kind of what Daniel Lurie is proposing here. Um, and it, so to me, so I guess it does make sense to me that this would work. I guess I just figured San Francisco was a little more, uh, not sophisticated, but just, you know, they would suss this shit out a little sooner and this guy would not fly. Um, but it's, so it's saying a lot about the city that it's basically him and Breed in one poll in the Chronicle poll. But, you know, Peskin's poll was from, it looked like it was from public policy, uh, uh, Institute, which is a s- legitimate organization that does legitimate polling. So, um, whether or not he paid for it or not, it, uh, it's, it's from, it was more than likely a decent poll, but it's hard to gauge in these ranked choice situations. Again, that was, was just first choice votes. So, so it, no, no telling who's got, who's leading in second choice, third choice, you know, and how that would all play out. So if I was going to, in fact, I am going to speculate here. I think maybe London Breed isn't doing so well because <clears throh> her first time, uh, she ran as like a practical progressive, right? She yeah. she ran like not as like a lefty or whatever. She certainly ran a little bit to the t- toward the center of where where Peskin's probably running, 
but she ran as like a practical progressive and she has not governed as what we might call a practical progressive. And I think maybe some of the people that voted for her <clears throat> before have been like disillusioned by some of what's going on, particularly the, the way that the, the homeless situation has been handled. Cause I, you never would have guessed from her messaging in her last campaign that, that, that she would uh, run with, run with the, the, the fucking way that California is handling the homeless and the way that she has. Yeah, and um, I, I think it's also worth pointing out that um, she's using messaging in this campaign. Um, I don't have any ads from her right now. I think we might have watched one before on Down Ballot, but her ads and her messaging in this campaign are very much about trying to paint all of these things that she's doing, the public safety, the um, uh, the, the the how she's handling the, uh, the unhoused um, and taking that more punitive approach. She's trying to frame this as progressive, as you know, right. humane and that kind of thing, right? So she's saying this is progressive. What I'm doing is progressive. Um, so she's trying to reframe the whole narrative, um, which is also probably why Daniel Lurie is being is successful right now because uh, he's just had the same narrative all along. This the system is fucked. They built the system. I'm here to disrupt the system. And it, <clears throat> right, it but that's the funny working. part is like he's a rich guy, so he is the system. It's true, and he's been part of the system, right? <laughs> it's, um, like but fucking, spent, it's like when it's like when Elon Musk comes out and says, "Oh, the system's fucked." It's like, well, it works for you pretty well, doesn't it, asshole? Right. Well, I, but if you can spend enough money, you can convince people of anything. So and you can set <clears> the narrative <throat> yourself. All right, uh, we're going to move to Berkeley. Their measure it's measure GG, which people on Twitch would like because that's a that's a little code for good game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to find out. There's a, a sort of a tug of war going on in berkeley between uh their uh, economic concerns and their environmentalism as election day approaches there is a debate between the economy and the environment on the ballot in berkeley measure gg proposes a tax on natural gas use but some business owners say it's too expensive and could force them to close ktv's crystal bailey breaks down the proposed ordinance and spoke to folks on both sides of the debate new at six Supporters of Measure GG say the goal is to oh incentivize the switch to cleaner energy. It proposes a new tax on natural gas use for all buildings more than 15,000 square feet, including residential buildings, businesses, and nonprofits. The 609 buildings that would be taxed by this measure make up 1.5% of Berkeley's building stock, but they emit about 23% of Berkeley's emissions. The tax would start at just under $3 per therm of natural gas and increase each year with inflation plus 6% until 2050. We want to be able to make it more expensive for the folks who are using more and help folks who might be in the most financial need transition. Dr. Ashley McClure, a primary care doctor in the East Bay, says the use of natural gas is dangerous for both public health and climate change, as the earth is expected to warm three degrees Celsius this century. Natural gas, when we burn it, um, it releases things like particulate matter, nitro nitrogen dioxide, um, carbon monoxide that are all known to be extremely harmful to our health. We believe in electrification um, and we believe in the intention of this measure, but it's very ill-conceived in how it's being implemented. Tom Parrish of Berkeley Repertory Theater says six of the non sure. buildings will be impacted. It would triple our cost of natural gas. Um, and which is untenable as we're trying to come back from the pandemic and rebuild audiences. Parrish says to switch over to another energy source would cost the organization millions. Boychick Bagels CEO and founder Emily Winston says the tax will hurt restaurants and commercial tenants renting space in large buildings, putting small businesses in jeopardy. There's a number of restaurants that are saying that they're not going to be able to, to survive. Winston says replacing... Dude, that's kind of fucked if you're the tenant of a building that and you have this little tiny restaurant, but the building itself has hella square feet and now you're taxed the same as if you were a like a large business on this that's kind of fucked yeah no it, it is um and again unintended consequences right uh this is the the danger of the you know the citizens initiative and the ability of the people to put stuff on the ballot because it's not always you know clean and easy uh and in fact there's a lot of pain that goes with it usually a million dollars. A report to city council estimates the proposed tax on the bagel shop's factory will cost about $10,000 the first year. But Winston says those numbers are not accurate. And according to her energy bill, she could see a $46,000 increase. It's a real problem. And it makes me consider, you know, do I really want to continue and grow this business in Berkeley? It's going to cost money. There's no way around that. 
and it's money really well spent. If passed, the tax proceeds, which would be more than $26 million a year, would go towards climate change and green energy initiatives in the city of Berkeley. It would go into effect on January 1st. In Berkeley, Crystal Bailey, KTVU, Fox 2 News. I got an idea. Huh. Why, why don't why, why don't you spend some of that money helping Boy Chick Bagels and these other businesses upgrade their shit to non-natural gas, you know, uh, devices, appliances? That that would be, I think, a very valuable use of the the funds, especially if they were the ones generating it. It could be a nice uh, reciprocal process. Maybe I don't know. I don't. Maybe I'm crazy. It seems like a. It seems like just a poorly written thing because, like, yeah. Again, like the building itself is so you're also like people like tenants in big apartment buildings where there's natural gas are going to get hit by this too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and because they're and not them directly, right? Their landlords will get hit with it and then their landlords, landlords will pass the, uh, the expense on to them. Yeah. Very much so. so, well, <clears throat> well, well, we'll see how that goes. I think everybody's going to, yes. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know enough about Berkeley. Berkeley's changing a lot. So Berkeley's uh, tacking toward, let's say, the center lately. Yeah, all, we'll, all the we'll rich see, people. See what happens. And I think that um, those are, you know, it's not like Target or, um, you know, Costco are the ones complaining here. But not, I shouldn't single them out. But, you know, Walmart, it's boy chick bagels, right? It's, right. It's mom and pop or uh, businesses. Um, it's the Berkeley rep. Everyone loves the Berkeley rep. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think they'll probably shoot it down, but we'll see. And not for nothing, as far as, like, heating a building right now, natural gas is the most efficient way to do it. Like, Yeah, I mean, there's there's not a lot of uh, efficient or cheap ways to, to do it, really. There's there are a lot of newfangled ways. It just costs money because it's newfangled. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a gas stove here, and I love that shit. I've always enjoyed cooking on gas. Convection works pretty well. The new convection ovens are, or stoves are pretty nice. They heat up and they got uh, quickly. They got uh, the control that you need as a as a cook. Um, but we'll we'll see. Like I said, I don't know if Berkeley's getting rid of that anytime soon. So up next, we're going to move on to winners and losers, and it looks like uh, some ballots got lost. I guess, or stolen, or we'll find out if how serious this is and, and where this is. We are nearing the end. 12 days left to cast your ballots. And if you opted to vote by mail, you should have received your ballot by now. But as we told you last night, some people in one Berkeley neighborhood haven't because their mail was stolen. And that has people worried that the thieves could fraudulently cast those stolen ballots in this historic election. NBC Bears Gia Vang took those concerns directly to local elections officials. Pretty sure the thieves just threw the ballots away and were looking for checks and stuff. To find out what do you do if that happens to you? Julie Chervin is worried. You vote in person. Her ballot never arrived along with many of her Berkeley neighbors. Now she's learned it could have been stolen after police say the mail carrier who reported the crime on October 9th told them ballots and election mail were inside the truck. If somebody had a mind to, they could just, you know, vote fraudulently for everybody on the block. So what now for these really? voters? We spoke to local elections <laughs> officials in three counties, Alameda County, Contra Costa. Because yeah, they know the ballots are missing. All agree on the first step. Yeah, like, we really, recommend oh. to call your local elections official uh, right away. In that case, we'll be able to uh, reissue you a ballot and uh, flag the, uh, the older uh, ballot. But what if they don't do that in time? Could someone vote fraudulently for them? Uh, they'll have to sign the ballot and we will have all the signatures in the household. And once the ballot comes in, we run it through our uh, scanning sorting machines. And then those scanning and sorting machines will scan the envelope and the signature. Somebody would have to know their signature. They would have to have a lot of other information in order to be able to vote fraudulently for somebody. The security around this process is extraordinary. California has one of the best procedures in place. Each person's ballot also has a barcode, so elections offices know where it is each step of the way to getting to your mailbox. There's lots of chain of custody rules that we have within our um, each of our departments here. And then, um, you know, even in terms of working very closely with the post office to ensure that those ballots that go into the mail 
you get delivered where they're supposed to get delivered. If it doesn't, like Julie again, report it. Julie tells me she's reported the potential theft to the Secretary of State and will now vote in person. If you haven't gotten your vote by mail ballot yet, you should have, and you should probably call your local elections office. Also, check the Secretary of State website because you can also check if this is still going to get mailed to you, hopefully soon. It does require some personal information. Gia Vang, NBC, Bay Area News. Okay. Yeah, I can't imagine that whoever stole the mail um, was interested in the ballots because it looked like it was just for like a block and you're not going to like swing an election. I think it was an unfortunate coincidence, as would be my guess here. Yeah, it's it's pretty typical of election season. And um, but everyone's very hyper aware right now of of theft of the vote, right? Steal the vote. So uh, and speaking of theft, uh, campaign season brings with it all sorts of malfeasance. Um, so maybe ballots aren't being stolen, but I think this is probably even more nefarious. Oh, the signs, signs the, 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 the war the of the signs always happens. The battle of the signs. We're going to find out about some pleasanton, some unpleasantness in Pleasanton in their elections. With a little more than a week left until election day, people in Pleasanton are raising some concerns over thieves stealing campaign signs from their front yards. Kara St. Cyr reports. I like the ghost there. That's cute. Robin and Barbara Comstock line their yards with campaign signs announcing their picks for the mayoral, presidential, and school board races. But when they woke up one morning, they saw one sign was missing. I mean, just beyond the aspect of, okay, they're coming onto our private property without permission, and then they're taking something, whether it's a sign or something else, it's just not the right way to behave. The Comstocks figured the theft was nothing more than a prank, but the next night, two more signs were taken. This time, specifically the one supporting mayoral incumbent Carla Brown's campaign. And that was actually over here, up here, and they took that. Nice fucking house. Surveillance video, which we were asked not to show, picked up a black SUV with three people stealing the signs Thursday night. It also caught attempts on Friday and Saturday when thieves again Mm. came to take the same signs. But Barbara had a hand in preventing those. Now I'm really upset, so I put Vaseline on all our signs. (laughs) I know, I know, but I was like... Darn it, you're going to have sticky fingers if you have sticky fingers. Yeah, the Comstock situation fingers. is part of a larger trend hitting Pleasanton's downtown area. Over the weekend, the Pleasanton Voters Organization, a group that endorses Brown, reported up to 50 stolen signs. In a statement, the organization condemned the activity, saying it doesn't sync with the city's brand of community of character. They just took the sign right off the metal because that way they don't have to mess with the the metal part. When they throw the sign in their car, they can just toss it in the back seat. The Borgs, who also had Carla Brown's sign stolen between Friday and Saturday, say they're even more shocked because Brown's opponent, Jack Balch's signs, were untouched in their neighbor's lawn. We've been involved in local politics probably since the 70s, and we've worked on mayoral campaigns and city council campaigns. And we've never seen anything like this. Both couples have since reported <laughs> sure you have. measures to prevent further theft, hoping a brave face may stop people who are thinking of stealing. They were not taken. So, but the word had already kind of gotten out that people had had this happen. And, you know, so maybe, maybe whoever did it kind of got the word to cool it. Stealing a campaign sign is a crime in all 50 states. It's a misdemeanor here in California. Like that sign that said yes on PP. Yes on PP. I'm all for PP. Well, there you go. Uh, the the dangers of campaign season. Um, but it does actually get even more dangerous out there. Apparently, um, we uh, as I mentioned, we I've been out knocking doors. Uh, it's one thing to be knocking doors when you're you know a six foot three dude, right? Um, it's another thing when we send you know fifteen year old high school students out to knock doors in certain neighborhoods. So. Um, we're going to find out what happened uh, in Oakland to a campaign worker who was allegedly assaulted. Some Bay Area campaign workers say they were assaulted while trying to do their civic duty. Among the injured, a young man who was pistol whipped, sending him to the emergency room. It happened Jesus. early Wednesday evening in North Oakland. And as NBC Bay Area's Tom Jensen reports, the candidate and her campaign workers say they will not be intimidated. The campaign workers for Oakland City Council member Carol Fife were canvassing the many apartment buildings in the 200 block of Fairmont Street at about 7 p.m. Wednesday when it happened. A window for them 
to not engage in this kind of activity at this building. No big deal at first for these canvassers who, like many other campaign workers, walk door to door hanging literature and talking to voters about their candidate. But things escalated very quickly, according to City Council member Carol Fife. He came downstairs, chased them aside uh, and was yelling at them and proceeded to hit one in the head with a handgun. That young man was taken to the emergency room at Kaiser. Today, Councilmember Fife shared pictures of the canvassing teams who have volunteered this election cycle and videos of some sharing their experiences. You never know what kind of person's on the other side of the door. She says this attack has hit her particularly hard because these young volunteers were stopped from doing what they believe in and one of them was seriously hurt. But Fife says even from his hospital bed, that volunteer says he's not quitting and neither is the the rest of the team. He said he wants to keep door knocking and this is just encouraging him, the rest of the canvassers to want to continue to push for this. So we're going to have a massive canvas in that very same neighborhood tomorrow at 10 a.m. The young man is expected to make a full recovery. Oakland PD is investigating, but so far no one has been arrested. In Oakland, Tom Jensen, NBC Bay Area News. I don't think that was election related, right? I think that, that I'm guessing that there was some other shit going on. Maybe that person was freaking out about something, didn't want anybody knocking on their door. Who knows? Yeah. No, it, it more than likely was not election related, but um, it is uh, it is a danger. Uh, when you're out there, you are knocking on the door of a complete stranger, whether they're registered to vote or not. And sometimes it may not be, especially when you're knocking apartments. It's why I really don't like knocking apartments, but in some districts, it's just all you got to knock. Um, it's a renter situation, right? So the person on your list may not be in a lot of situations, the person that is living there now, right? They may have registered and uh, moved and hadn't re-registered and the person there now, right? You have no idea who that is. So it's, it's a dicey situation um, and you got to be careful. But uh, I, yeah, I would almost guarantee this had nothing to do with the election and just someone having a, an episode of some sort, uh, but I'm glad to hear the election worker is okay. And he wants to keep, uh, the volunteer and wants to keep volunteering and knocking doors. That's the spirit. Good Lord. I deal with so many people who are like, I want to knock doors. I want, don't you have any envelopes I can stuff? Do you have any more lawn signs? And I'd be like, no, go knock doors. And they'd be like, can I make phone calls? Go knock doors. And so this, this is great. I love this guy. I, I just got pistol whipped. I'm going to go knock more doors. God bless you. So most years we've done a full episode of ballot box bingo this year. It just wasn't in the cards. So we're not going to yeah. have a lot of time. We're not going to have time really to talk about the election because the next uh, time we're going to reconvene is election night. And maybe we'll think about if we're uh, doing anything for that night or what the fuck's going on around here. We don't really yeah, cover seriously. elections here. Um, but we're going to go over some of the propositions. This is uh, Cal matters. This is a um, nonpartisan group that uh, tries to give out election information so far as I know. And, um, we're yep. going to first hear about Proposition 5. Yeah, these are minute explanations of the props. So these are some of the ones I wanted to pull out because you're hearing a lot about them. So Prop 5 has to do with uh, the threshold to pass ballot measures, which we talked about earlier. In 2022, voters in Berkeley were asked whether they wanted the city to borrow $650 million to fund affordable housing. 59% of the voters who turned out, an overwhelming majority, said yes. The measure failed. How is that possible? And how would a statewide proposition on this year's ballot change the electoral math behind borrowing? Hi, I'm Ben Christopher, housing reporter with Cal Matters, and this is Prop 5 in a Minute. Back in the 1970s, Californians voted to make it much harder for local governments to raise taxes or borrow money. Ever since then, whenever a city or county wants to go into debt, they have to get permission from the voters. Not only that, in most cases, they have to win the support of at least two-thirds of voters to win. That's why the bond in Berkeley failed, even though it got 59% of the vote. Prop 5 would reduce the threshold for bonds that fund affordable housing and the whole list of public infrastructure projects. The new cutoff? 55%. Supporters say the current system makes it way too hard for local governments to fund important projects, including affordable housing. They also argue that letting a small minority override the wishes of the majority is just undemocratic. Opponents say the choice to go into debt should be made only when there's a broad agreement across the community, especially since bonds tend to get paid back through higher taxes on property owners. So vote yes if you want to make it easier for local governments to borrow to fund affordable housing and other infrastructure. Vote no if you want to keep things the way they are. 
to learn more about everything in your 2024. Very nice. That was a good explanation. <clears throat> I would pretty good. I just personally, I'd probably be inclined to vote. Yes. Yes. I'm, I, I'm a personally a proponent of 50% plus one on every vote. I mean, it's a majority. It's democracy. That's what it is. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's perfectly fine with me for 55. Let's go all the way to 51%. But, um, that's so prop five, uh, interesting note about prop five, uh, it will apply retroactively if it passes to everything that's on the ballot next Tuesday, right? So if say you were pushing a parcel tax or a school bond that requires two thirds approval today, if prop five passes on Tuesday, that you would only need 55% to pass, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, if you're, if it's on the ballot on Tuesday, very interesting side note. So there's a shit ton of like bond proponents and, local bond measure and school parcel tax. I think even uh, your neck of the woods, producer Dave, um, some proponents who are hopefully are counting on prop five passing um, so that their measure will pass because they're seeing polling that's, and they went to the ballot with polling that showed them only maybe 60, 65%, not enough to get over that two thirds threshold. Yeah. Especially against a negative campaign from like the taxpayers association. Is there messaging by any of these local, uh, like local organizations that are pushing for these, uh, <clears throat> like local ballot measures that are like vote yes on this and vote yes on prop five because yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. They're, they're, they're in league. In fact, prop, the prop five people are leaning on all of those groups to, to help them spread their message, uh, cause they don't have a whole lot of resources themselves. Um, so yeah, they're definitely counting on all these local districts and measure, uh, proponents to, uh, to do their messaging for them. Um, we'll see if it works. Oh, here's prop 33. I, I haven't been seeing any television commercials about prop 33 when I hook up the antenna late at night and watch N channel five. Nothing, yeah. Nothing at all. Really. I, I, I have no idea that this is even happening, but uh, that's why <laughs> I, I put that. That's why I put this one on here. Cause I wanted to get just a quick minute of facts about it. Cause you're hearing a lot of back and forth about this one. The rent is too damn high. You've likely heard that refrain as millions of Californians struggle to pay. So what should we do about it? That will be a question on your ballot this November. Hi, I'm Marisa Kendall, homelessness reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Prop 33 in a Minute. Many California cities limit how much a landlord can raise rent each year. That's called rent control. Three decades ago, lawmakers limited those limits. Basically, cities can't impose rent control on single family homes or apartments built after 1995. That's because of a law known as Costa Hawkins. Prop 33 would change that, letting cities impose whatever rent control they want. Sound familiar? We've been here before, twice. Similar ballot measures failed in 2018 and 2020. Supporters of Prop 33 say cities should be able to decide whether and how to cap rents. Opponents argue rent control makes rental housing less lucrative, leading to fewer homes getting built. So, vote yes if you want your city to be able to expand rent control. Vote no if you want the state to continue to limit rent control. To learn more about everything in your 2024 <clears throat> ballot, go to CalMat. Thank you, Marissa. So, that doesn't make any sense, though, because when you develop the property, the first time you rent it out, rent control doesn't apply. So, you can, you can set the rent at whatever you want. Correct. And when you re re rent, when someone, when a tenant leaves and you put the unit back on the market, you can get market rate of whatever that is now um, and raise it to that. Now, it should be pointed out that most places that have implemented rent control, including San Jose, uh, the cap, um, it, the, again, there's no cap on the rent and how high the rent can go eventually. It's a cap on how much they can raise it annually, right? So, right. In, for, for example, in San Jose, you can raise the rent 5% in any given year, right? Um, That's 50, and, uh, 50 on every thousand. Correct. And if you were to say, okay, I don't want to raise the rent um, 5% this year. I'm only going to raise it 2% this year. You can bank 3%. And say raise it eight percent next Wait, year. What? Does that make sense, right? So yeah, it's yeah. like it, that, 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 like how you used to be able to roll over your minutes on your phone plan, right? So the landlord can say, "Well, I'm okay. I, I only need to raise the rent on you two percent this year, even though I could do five percent, and I'm going to take that three percent and apply it to next year. And in theory, if I wanted to, I could raise it eight percent next year, right? Um, you can't do that ad nauseum, but that's that's pretty much the limit of what you could do now. 
inflation is actually below 5% or re- usually right now it's actually a little bit, I think above, but um, typically inflation is below that. So the 5% is actually above the cost of living increase, the inflation increase. So landlords are actually doing pretty well if they can raise it 5% a year. However, that's not what they do. Usually they don't try to be- beat around the margins, right? They're trying to make cheese, serious money. And that's why the last time the councilman was a renter, this would have been 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, my landlord was going to increase the rent 18% in one go, and I couldn't make that work, so I moved home, and ever since, I've either been living at home or got lucky, and now the uh, good wife and I have uh, sustainable living arrangements, but that's what you're facing out there, and I don't think it is cutting into anyone's profit margin, especially these huge landlords, to, to allow them to raise the rent 5% every year, I mean, year over year. Uh, it's not killing them at all, especially with the money they're making off the top, like you just said. So um, this, and this would actually, does this does not actually implement rent control at all. All it does right. is allow cities to do it on buildings that were built within the last 30 years. That's pretty, that's the, the baseline. It's not like that 30 year window moves, right? It's not like suddenly, like five years from now, it'll still be going back 30 years. It goes back to 1995. That's the law just, so anything built since then, no matter where we are, that's what you can apply it to. So all we're saying is that you can, if a city wants to implement it on those properties and buildings, it can do it. It's a battle every time they try to do it anyway. So it's not as though this is going to happen overnight. But what the opponents say is that it's going to stifle more building because builders can't get more money, right? Which is complete bullshit. Right, um, because the person, the people who build the fucking, like they, it's more complicated than that. Sometimes yeah. the people who build the housing just immediately sell it to some fucking giant property management company or something like that like yeah it's it's a it's a big web of of profit margins and money and everyone's trying to make out so um whenever there's a a a proposal of rent control or some sort of work like this right that uh the apartment association the realtor association everybody comes out of the woodwork to defend you know mom and pop landlords rights to to make money off their property so uh, we'll see how this one turns out. The only down, the downside of this is that the no campaign has a lot of money and they're, running, lot of pretty money. Eff- they're br- running pretty effective ads. I've I think, seen about zero it. yes ads and that's how I knew I was probably going to vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a good number of yes ads, but not as many as the apartment association has been throwing at the no side. And I have a general rule of if the apartment association is on one side, I am on the other side. So <laughs> right. I'm definitely voting. I'm definitely voting yes. Uh, the only... The quirk here in what Prop 34 is about is who's funding the no on 30 or the yes on 33 campaign. It's funded primarily by the AIDS Health Foundation, which is, uh, or, or at least their founder, um, which is interesting um, in, in and of itself, other than he's just a, a big proponent of progressive causes, but not as well, you know, universally loved. So apparently there's some vindictiveness about him, and the Apartment Association is funding this measure to basically get back at them for putting to hawkins on the ballot so we're gonna learn more about prop 34 and why you're hearing both of these if you're hearing a yes on 33 you're probably hearing no on 34 if you're hearing no on 33 you're probably hearing yes on 34 in the same ad and this is well, why let's see what the let's see what's going on with 34 there's a prop on this year's ballot that has something to do with spending restrictions on healthcare providers and medical negotiations and something called the 340b drug pricing program but really It's all about this guy. Let me explain. I'm Ben Christopher, housing reporter with CalMatters, and this is Prop 34 in a minute. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation is one of the biggest users of a federal discount drug program that gives cheaper medicine to health providers that serve low-income patients. Its CEO is a guy named Michael Weinstein. Weinstein is kind of famous in California political circles, and not because of healthcare. His foundation has bankrolled three statewide campaigns to remove limits on rent control, along with a bunch of other controversial issues. All of this has made Weinstein a political enemy of the state's landlord lobby, and now they're funding Prop 34. <laughs> The initiative says that if you're a health provider using this federal discount drug program and you spend a lot of money on non-medical things and you own a lot of apartment buildings and you have a bunch of code enforcement violations, then you have to spend almost all of your money providing health care. 
As far as anyone can tell, this would only apply to Weinstein's organization. Supporters <laughs> say discounts meant to fund health care for poor people should be used for that and not for, say, unrelated political campaigns. Opponents say this is just a political vendetta. So vote yes if you want the AIDS Healthcare Foundation and, and similar <laughs> health providers to spend virtually all of their money on direct patient care. Vote no if you want to leave things the way they are. To learn more about everything on your 2024 Let's go with chaos and vote yes on both of them. <laughs> Let them fight. Fuck it. Well, we'll vote yes to repeal Costa Hawkins, and then we'll vote yes to to um, ensure that we'll never have to vote one way or the other on Costa Hawkins ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty much what the what the apartment association is trying to do. They're trying to not just beat the bat, beat them at the ballot box on the issue, but then crush their ability to be able to bring this forward ever again. Right. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty much politics as usual. It's so that's exactly what people wild hate. that they included that. Oh, also, this person like owns a bunch of rental property. What the fuck? Yeah. So it's too uh, complicated. It's, I, I, I like clearly like the, the guy they're talking about is probably like fucking like um like healthcare washing his scumbagginess. I'm not like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I'm not saying that uh, the guy's a, a, a saint. Right. And like I said, he's got enemies on both sides in fact there's a ton of people who i know in the you know housing um advocacy space who are voting no on this because they don't like this dude for whatever reason they don't like that he's the one supporting it or they don't like how it's written right the um the, whatever you know whatever nuances they're looking for so yeah it I, it has very little chance of passing unfortunately again um i'll still vote yes but uh it's it's something that has to be explored at some point and the only reason it's on the ballot over and over again is because the legislature is too chicken shit to deal with it. So my message to new legislators coming in next year and anyone who's currently in the legislature, get off your ass and do something and stop, stop kowtowing to the California apartment association. Those people are trash and you can expose them as trash and you will win your reelection because you will get something done that helps people. That's my message. All right. We're going to check out prop 36 next. Excellent. Uh, so Prop 36 is uh, what we'll find out, trying to basically go back and say, oops, we let ourselves go to a little too far on that restorative justice tip, so we're going to bring it back a bit. It's Mayor Ed 209's wet dream, basically. Ten years ago, Californians rejected the war on drugs. Instead of long sentences and overcrowded prisons for drug possession and shoplifting, voters chose to make those crimes misdemeanors. But prosecutors, the police, and big box retailers say those changes have made crime worse. In November, voters get to choose. Do they think harsher sentences will prevent crime? And would imposing them really cut down on homelessness? I'm Nigel Duara, justice reporter with Cal Matters, and this is Prop 36 in a Minute. Way back in the 2000s, California's government had a problem. Years of three strike laws had filled prisons beyond their capacities. In 2014, voters passed Prop 47. It made stealing something worth less than $950 into a misdemeanor. It did the same thing to some drug crimes. Prop 36 would unwind some of that, reinstating harsher penalties for some theft and drug crimes. Supporters say the measure would cut down on homelessness by forcing unhoused people into drug treatment. Or putting them in jail. Opponents say the measure will waste hundreds of millions of dollars to lock up people who don't pose a danger to society. So vote yes if you want to increase the penalties on shoplifting and drug possession. Vote no if you want to keep things well, the way they are. Pretty, to learn more that's about everything pretty, pretty clear cut what I'm voting, how I'm voting on this one. I don't know about you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's just it would be a complete reversal of where I think we should be headed as a state and as a society. So yeah, fuck that shit. There's a reason why we passed the 47 in the first place, and nothing has changed since then to to cause me to believe that um, it, it has made the world more dangerous. That's complete bullshit. Um, and we're not sending anyone back to prison either. So, uh, Mayor Ed 209, you got to figure something else out. And it's interesting to know Mayor Ed 209 and Gavin are on opposite sides of this. There's mayors on both sides of this um, up and down the state. So it's it's definitely tearing a lot of folks apart. I have no idea what's going to happen at the end of the day. I have a feeling it's going to pass because just I feel like that's where people are at right now and where the vote voter the voting electorate is right now. Um, more moderate, but you know it'll swing back again eventually. So, I think over, over time it'll arc back this other way. I haven't seen a lot of messaging around it at all. Like a lot of so, I think that's good because yeah, I think people might just see it and be like, "Well, do we really want to be throwing people in jail for longer for shoplifting?" Right. So, it's most mostly been digital. I've seen a lot of digital ads for it. Um, 
when I'm on uh, social and uh, other spaces, website, you know, news websites. So I have seen a lot of that. I haven't seen, you're right, I haven't seen a lot on TV about it, except in the news. They've been getting a lot of earned, like Mayhan's trying to get a lot of earned media by doing press conferences and things like that. And he's, he's been successful. So it's gotten into like the local news a bit, but not to the point where it's saturated and people really know what's going on. So when they read it, yeah, I, I hope, I hope just like you that when they read it, they'll be like, you know, no, that's fine. And up next, um, we got the last one, which is a uh, prop six, which I have heard nothing about. I, yeah, I hadn't either. And I, that's the only reason I'm including it here is because I did not know what it was about. And I think it's really important to, to take a look at. California banned slavery when it became a state, but it made an exception. From the beginning, California in its constitution has allowed forced labor as a form of criminal punishment. Today, tens of thousands of prison inmates all over the state are working in a variety of jobs, from firefighters to cooks, for very little pay. That could change if voters pass a ballot measure this November that would change the state constitution to ban any kind of forced work. I'm Wendy Fry, reporter for Cal Matters, and this is Proposition 6 in a Minute. Californians are talking about ending forced labor in prisons in part because of the state's reparations task force. That committee was appointed in 2020 to investigate the harmful and long-lasting effects of enslavement on African Americans. It recommended banning forced labor as a way to erase enslavement from the state's founding document. Proposition 6 would amend the California Constitution to prohibit the state from punishing inmates with involuntary work assignments and from disciplining those who refuse to work. There is some uncertainty about how the measure would affect the state budget and prison work programs. Experts say it could open the door to forcing the state to pay more money to inmates with jobs. Today, most of them earn less than 74 cents an hour. Supporters say it's important for voters to put an end to forced labor 174 years after California joined the union as a free state. They also say the state can avoid the cost of higher inmate pay by creating voluntary prison work programs. There's no registered opposition to the measure. A handful of Republican lawmakers voted against placing the measure on the ballot. Some have raised concerns about the potential cost of raising inmate pay. So vote yes if you want to forbid the state from forcing prison inmates to work. Vote no if you want to keep things the way they are. To learn more about everything... Is this a, uh, because it's the Constitution, is this a two-thirds vote or is this just a simple majority? Oh, good question. Darn. Uh, I don't know. And I don't know if it would apply under the Prop 5, if Prop 5 would pass either. Uh, that's a great question. I just thought it was very important and a good counterpoint, or not counterpoint, but a good um, uh, pairing with Prop 36, because um, we're talking about uh, inmates' rights. And yeah, this is complete bullshit. I know from, I have personal familial experience with this, knowing how this, this system works, and it is complete bullshit. These guys get, just work to the bone, and don't get anything out of it. Like you like to think, oh, they've got this nice bank account when they come out of prison, right? And they can live on that for a little while. No, it's nothing like that. It's like, it's it's paltry. It's enough to like get, you know, pay the rent one month, and maybe. Not for nothing, can't department. they use that money like at the commissary to get like fucking tooth, toothpaste and shit? And they have to, and they do, right? Yeah. Like, uh, my, you know, my uh, my relative came out of the can like almost in debt to the, to the CDCR, so... Uh, yeah, it's it's not the what's cracked up to be, and I really hope everyone votes yes to to end this practice and to give these folks what they deserve. Because um, if we're going to spend a shit ton of money on the carceral system and our prisons, it may as well be going to the inmates who need it when they get out, so that they're right. not back in prison again. And then we can shrink the carceral system, and over time, we get we get to a point where we're not imprisoning everyone um, for everything, and we're 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 trying to be more humane and live with each other a little better. So. Interesting. I want the messaging I've been getting from Thirty Three, which I waited until we did something before I really looked into it. The messaging I was getting <clears throat> led me to believe that I would be conflicted on Thirty Three, and I am not. Well, that's that's good. What do you want to speak to that a little bit? I know we're we're pushing up on time, but how, what? I just I just saw that. I forget. It wasn't the Apartment Association. It was some other group that was like um, the real opposing. Thing, maybe opposing 33 i forget what other group it was and i was like well sometimes politics make strange bedfellows and so maybe there's something going on here but no yeah. no no they just want to make it so city they want to make it so uh i don't i don't well i don't know why the fuck it matters what year your fucking apartment was built that's what that's this, 
Yeah, the argument was made that I think at the time that um, older units are quote unquote naturally affordable, right? So that the rent was probably not too high on anything that was older anyway, like especially now it's been 30 years. So anything older than 30 years, you know, the theory is the rent's not that high to begin with when you and I both know it doesn't really matter the quality or the age of the unit. Like if it's a unit and it's got loca- Silicon Valley location, it's going to go for a good amount and, at market and rate. And like with proper maintenance a 30 year old building is fucking just fine i don't know what the fuck yeah, what do you mean abs- it's, it's oh, not dingy absolutely. or run down or like you've been absolutely you've, you've been in all these like there's all these old houses that are just yeah. beautiful and there's all like if properly maintained you can have a 50 year old apartment there are probably plenty of luxury apartment buildings in new york city that are over 50 years old Yep, hundred percent. And you could stagger it and and figure out a way to to stagger the, the 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 rates and the increases so that it makes makes it easier for mom and pop quote unquote landlords who have like the six apartment or eight apartment you know uh, building. I'm sure um, those folks are doing just fine. Yeah, it's like their retirement nest egg, right? You can make sure they do fine too. You can make sure that it works out, and well, it just I mean, takes what, more if regulation. They, they, they got, if they got six apartment units like here in the Bay Area, they fucking things that's getting hard on them as landlords. Fucking well, I don't know, sell it. Yeah, right. That's that was sort of my my argument the whole time. And the the big the big caveat here is that the the apartment association and the realtors they call themselves housing providers. That's what they that's how they refer to themselves and their constituents: housing providers, landlords. Right. Um. Go, okay. go figure. Well, anyway, that's the show. Do you want to read the show out? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks again, Professor Dave. Thanks for letting us go a little over. I hope everyone sticks around for public comment. It's going to be fun as always. Once the light goes red, as it already is. Um, so please stay tuned. Thanks so much for tuning in for Ballot Box Bingo. Uh, please vote if you haven't already. Make your voice heard. Get informed, uh, please, before you do. Um, you know, Share this, uh, this vidcast podcast stream with everyone you know. We are not the ninth best local news podcast in California, according to some dude, for no reason. We actually have a few things to say. So please uh, make the rounds with this and, and encourage all your friends and family to vote as well. So we can have a big, big turnout and make sure that we get all the right people elected. Anyway, uh, thanks for joining us in down ballot. We will be back in some form next week. We'll see since it's election night, things get crazy. Um, but seven thirty PM Pacific, most Tuesdays, make sure you get vaxxed, make sure you wear a mask. Pants are optional. We're going to leave you with audible smoke. We hope you have a great night. Peace out. <laughs> Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing green Sit with the front of the stage waiting for FTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing queen I think the fuck up on stage and rock the scene yeah. We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Enjoy the band I turn and head back to the bar For a refill, man, because you know where we are we're headed out to the car To smoke another one what? And another one Woo! Now just when the magic starts kicking in I hear we left playing And you know it's time to head in Alright everybody now it's time to grab a new drink Spark it if you got it And then pass it to me yeah. We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. Last up on the field for the show tonight is down me dirty and five, so we're headed outside to spark up another joint. Now who's got my lighter? Stone E, of course. Shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch, being who I gotta be. I'm fucked up like the U.
U.S. economy The truth is, is that I don't think logically Stone to E, take you on a psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me And outside shit we smoke a lot of rockin' me Rockin' the rolly, all the sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck, but I'll probably do it sloppily We do what we want What we wanna do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We want us to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band.